we have a picture of a function. Uh, the function's name is f, and we can tell that from looking at this first equation here, y equals f of x. Notice that uh, we're familiar with some of this notation, but we're going to give it some new, new definitions today, some of the terms that we're more familiar with, like x-intercepts. We have a new name for x-intercepts. So let's take a look at what this means. What does f of 0 mean? It says, find the output value. I know for some of you this is new, so find the output value when our input value, when the input value, which is x, equals 0. So it's asking you to find the output value, which we typically look for on a graph to be the y value. So when you answer something like this, you say f of 0 equals, and there's a single value that you put there. What you get, uh, Lorenzia? 3, right? Now, the point that corresponds to that notation, the coordinates of the point that corresponds to that is input 0, output 3, which we typically call our y-intercept. So anytime you're looking at the value of a function, the output value when your input is 0, you know that the result that you find is always where your graph crosses the y-intercept. And that can only happen at one value. You can't have more than one y-intercept for a function. Because if you did, it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. However, when we ask the next question, notice it's plural. Sometimes it could say value, and then the S could be in parentheses, but because I already have the picture here, I know that there are going to be two values for X where my output is zero. So this one differs in the fact that it's asking you to find the input values, values, when the output value, which we call f of x, or traditionally we call y, is 0. So that means you're going to look for when the graph crosses your x-axis, because that's when y is 0, right? So we look at our x-axis, and we notice that we cross at x equals negative 3. So notice I'm not asking you here for coordinates of a point. Anytime I ask you for a question like this, I'm asking you what value of x makes this equation true. It's a solution. So there's two values of x. x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 2. So these two values of x, when we put them in coordinate form, we traditionally call them the x-intercepts. But with our new notation now and with the idea of functions, we call these two values of x the zeros of a function. So if I ask you to find the zeros of a function, you say, what value of x makes my function zero? What I'm really asking for is the x values of your intercepts. That's what that really means, OK? But it's probably new language for some of you. You're very familiar with x and y intercepts. But zeros of a function is new. Okay. Any questions on that? OK, um, Paul, do you mind getting the door for me? All right, so we talked a little bit about uh, domain and ranges uh, on Wednesday of last week. We've defined domain and ranges to be sets. The domain is a set of all input that's valid in a function, or where your function is defined in the range is the corresponding set of output. So visually, if you look at this little um, function that I have here, now on my um, view you can see color, and on yours it's just black and white. So you see here that this function, f, starts here, it increases to some maximum point here, and then stops right here. So when we talk about a domain, remember, one of the things that's important is that you always think of domains and ranges as sets. It's a set of numbers. So the domain of f is got to be defined as either an interval or a set notation. You can't do it with a roster method here because it's an infinite number of points. 
So what we'll typically use for my math lab and for homework is an interval. So in this particular case, notice the way our book does this is unusual. They put the little brackets there to show where it begins and where it ends. So this would be the domain. Now, if we had values here, let's say this is the number 2 and this is the number 15. I'm just making this up. If we had the actual numbers here for x, then we could say the domain of x starts at 2, so I use a bracket, and it ends, it doesn't have an arrow, it ends at 15. So that would represent all possible values for x from my domain. And one way to imagine this is to imagine all these arrows coming down, and you'll see a nice visual, an animated visual of this in a minute. Since this graph is entirely above the x-axis, all these arrows are coming down, and it's carving out a chunk of the x-axis. That's your domain. Now, your range is another set, but it's the set of all your output. So now you're going to look at what chunk of the y-axis what chunk of your y-axis is carved out. So you look for, if possible, the smallest y-value, and you go up to your highest y-value. And notice your book uses these brackets here. And you have this interval. And let's say now this is 3 and 10. So in this case, your y value, which the lowest value of your y would start at 3, and it would include every single number up to 10. So this way you can imagine these horizontal arrows coming from your graph from the smallest value to the highest. So if we were writing the range of f, it would start at 3. 3 is included because it's a solid dot. And it doesn't end at this value. Remember, that's where your domain ends. It ends at your highest output value. That's critical to keep in mind. Am I looking at my chunks of my x-axis or chunks of my y-axis? So it would go 3 to 10. So here's the animation that I mentioned to you. Um, my colleague uh, Ian Winokur uh, did this uh, beautiful uh, an animation. Um, to show the domain and range. So here's a nice visual with those arrows. And you can see when your graph is above the x-axis, the arrows are coming down to the chunk on the x-axis. And then when the curve is below, it, the arrows come up. So if you were writing the domain for this, you'd say, oh, I start at 2 and I end at 6. So that's this interval right here, including both of those points, 2 to 6. But then I have another whole set of numbers that I have to put together with this. And that's why you use your union. And then the next set of numbers go from 7 to 15. So you've chunked out that part of your x-axis, and that represents the domain for this particular function. Okay. Similarly, we can look at the range. And again, the range goes to the y values and it chunks out parts of your y-axis. So here we start at negative 2. That's our smallest value, so I put it in here with a bracket. And I go up. Mm, I'm going to have to estimate here. So I estimated it to be 2 and a half. Then I have a gap. So I union this set from negative 2 to 2 and a half as my output values with 4 to 6. So that's how I find my domain and range. Any questions on that? So literally now, ever since I've seen this video, I always think about um, these arrows. It really helps me to imagine where my domain and where my range is. Any questions at all on domain and range? I know it's a little bit of a um, uh, review of last Wednesday. OK, so let's uh, see if we can apply what we've just learned to this question. You want to read this question for us, um, Nora? You can pass if you don't want to. OK. OK, so you make a guess as to what you think the domain is. Write it down, and we'll discuss it in like 10, 15 seconds. So you write it down. Do you have your packet, Jesse? OK. 
and then write the corresponding interval that you think represents the range of this function. And when everybody at your table has made some type of guess or written something down for this, just put up the flag so I'll know when people have had ample time to do it. This, um, some good discussion is happening at your tables, which is wonderful. Some of you um, have, we're discussing um, why the domain, some of you have for the domain, you have negative seven to five, and you're having a little bit of a discussion with your table mates as to why that is or isn't the domain. So if this, if this domain were negative seven to five, I'm just gonna use my hands now to cover up this graph, then the graph, this part of the graph wouldn't be there. It would stop right there at negative five, zero. But notice this graph continues, when you see that arrow, this graph continues right off the paper, through the ceiling, up into the sky. And therefore, this x-axis continues along with it, out to positive infinity. So this graph has a beginning point. It's right here at negative 7. So if you dropped your arrow down to negative 7, and you put your bracket, because that's a solid dot, then your domain, the very first number you would put in your domain, your smaller number here is negative seven. But if you followed this x-axis along to try to keep up with the graph, you'd have to go out to infinity. So it's negative seven to infinity. Okay, you all set with that? Okay, so it's not negative seven to five. And anytime you see the arrow, you know you've got to have an infinity in your answer. Now, what about the other way? The uh, range, what do you have for that? Someone want to tell me what you have for that? Yeah, James? Bracket negative three, infinity. Anybody have anything different? Yeah? Negative two, sorry. Oh, negative two. I like that better. Why do I like negative two better? Yeah, when you're dealing with the range, you're dealing with outputs. So range is output values. It's a set of all output values, and the domain is a set of all input values. Right, so you've just got to keep track. It's a common mistake to make. You know, this happens all the time. When you look at the coordinates, if you're talking about the range, you've got to look for the smallest value that sits along, or that's equivalent to your y-axis, the distance below the x-axis in this case. We all set with those two answers? All right. So let's take a look at the next page. This page often gives me heart palpitations because this the idea of even and odd functions or even and odd symmetry is not a hard idea to see visually. Okay? Most students can visually see when a function is even and when a function is odd. What what is the difficult part of showing whether a function is even or odd has to do with how you prove it. How do you prove it other than just picking at a point here and there along the two points along the graph? So one of the things I want to show you, because I think that um, some of us are not using um, all of the features of my math lab. Um, so let me just shut this off for a second. So if you wanted to do the chapter test prep in the book, and you, you run into some difficulty, there's a video showing you how to do it, okay? But over here, you have what's called guided visualizations, and further down, notice you have a lot more videos um, on particular subjects. So look at all the videos around symmetry. You have test for symmetry, interactive, 10 minutes long. You have identify even or odd functions and recognize their symmetry. So there's two videos there. And then look up here. There's one, two, three visualizations. So if you have difficulty with this today in class or it takes you a while, you have three, two videos and three visualizations to help you with this idea. The reason I'm showing you this is that you are... Some of you are not using all of the resources you have available to you to actually understand the material of this course. As you notice, last week I had to show some of you
that the e-textbook was actually here. Your textbook was located in my math lab. Some of you didn't know that. So when I say read, you know, the section, some of you thought you didn't have the textbook because all you had was my math lab online. And part of the reason I'm saying this is that today you're going to get your first test back. And part of you will probably be disappointed in how you did, and some of you will be very excited about how you did. And part of what getting the first test back has to do with in terms of a learning experience is number one, the first test often isn't the best test, even if the material may be the easier material for, of the class, because you haven't yet learned how to take a Math 107 test. So part of it is learning how to take a test, looking at your notes that you took in. How well did your notes prepare you for the test? Okay. And the other thing is to ask yourself, what am I really doing outside of this class? And if you're reading the textbook and taking notes on your reading and you're doing all your homework and you're keeping a homework notebook and keeping notes on your homework and you're coming to every class and you're asking questions and when you still have questions, you either ask me or you see a peer tutor, then you're doing everything possible to help yourself succeed in the class. So of those five things I mentioned, only you know what are those, which of those five things you are actually doing. I am here to help you as much as I can. And I've created these class notes for you. I've got these videos. But the difference between taking a class here at GCC and taking it at a high school is that in high school, most of your learning happens in class because you go to like a math class five times a week. But here you're here a couple times a week, three times, and most of your learning has to happen on the outside. And that's a big transition for people when they come, particularly soon out of high school. So think of all of those things I just mentioned. And so today, if I've written a note on your test to say, hey, let's get together so we can look at how you've studied and your cheat sheet or what questions you have, it's not like a punishment to come see me in my office. It's, I re I'm there to try to help you out so you can all be successful by the time you end this class. That's my goal, okay? So notice that you have a lot of wealth of material available to you, but I can't, I can't make you do this, but I wanted to point it out to you, okay? So you have these videos, and I'm, we're gonna take a look at one in particular today, uh, one called Symmetry of Function. So take a look at that, that graph right there. And look at your, your class notes. Does that look like the first class note graph? Yeah, okay. So that is, I didn't give you the equation, but here's the equation right here for this graph. It's f of x. If you want to write it down on your class notes, you can. f of x equals x to the fourth. So the equation for this graph is f of x equals x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 9. Now, they, they didn't put the equation down for a reason because they wanted you just looking at this graph and looking at input values and output values to get the idea of what it means for a graph to be a function to be an even function. And a graph, it's defined. And this is the part you don't have any problem with. An even function is symmetric about the y-axis. And some of us just envision taking this function and folding it along the y-axis. And for every point you have on this side to the right of zero, if you go the same distance to the left of zero, you'll be at exactly the same y-values. So how do we write that? Well, one way to write it is to say, if I have this point, on my graph, what other point would I have if it has even symmetry? So if x, y is a point on my graph, then the opposite of x, if I go to the, the same distance to the left of zero, my y value will be exactly the same, is also on my graph when I have even symmetry, when I have, or when I am an even function, when I'm an even function. Okay. 
So that's very abstract. X, Y, opposite of X, Y. But if we look at this table, we in the corresponding points here, if I go two and a half spaces to my right, my Y value is negative 14.44. And if you put F of 2.5 into this equation here and you raise it to the fourth power and you do all of this to it, you will get negative 14.44. If you go the same distance to the left, that's what the opposite of x means, and you find its y value, it's exactly the same. So that's why these points look the way they do. But let's put those points into functional notation. When we see x, y, it would look like this, x, f of x. I replace y with f of x. Now down here, the opposite of x, now y would be f of the opposite of x. And what we're saying is that the y value when you put x in, which is called f of x, and the y value when you put the opposite of x in, which is called f of negative x, are exactly the same. f of x equals f of the opposite of x. The two y values, these are two y values, are the same. y1, y2. It's this notation that really messes students up. They can see how the x's are opposite and the y values are the same. So let's just take a quick look again at this little um, visualization that you have in my math lab. So here's our function, and I'm just going to um, start showing the symmetry in the coordinates, and I'm just going to run this little video so you can watch it. I stopped it there. Again, when x is 3.29 and x is its opposite, notice we're at exactly the same height above the x-axis. Our y values are the same. This is true no matter what point we take to the right of 0 and then its corresponding opposite point to the left of 0. This is what it means to have even symmetry. So what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is if I asked you to prove that this was an even function, you have to show that it has this property. And it's really hard sometimes to understand what that says. So how you approach this, and you'll have some practice when you come to your um, class activities, is how you approach this is you say, OK, I have to show that f of x is equal to f of the opposite of x. I already know what f of x is. What can I replace f of x with? What does f of x equal? You see anywhere where it says f of x equals? It's in black. Yeah, the equation. Here's what f of x equals. When you put a number in here, like 2 and a half, for example, and you take 2 and a half and you raise it to the fourth power, and then you square 2 and a half and multiply it by 10, subtract it from 2.5 to the fourth power and add 9, you'll get negative 14.44. That's what f of any input is. So f of x, you just basically copy what your the equation is for your function. So you just write here, x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 9. That's f of x. Okay, your big question is, will that result be the same if I take this function and put the opposite value in? Now, when it's a number, it's really easy to do. You just put the opposite in there, and everywhere you see an x, you just replace it, remember, with parentheses. You just put the opposite value in, and you, get, you do your arithmetic. Now, we're going to do the same thing, but instead, Everywhere we see an x, we're going to replace it with the opposite of x. That's all. So instead of writing x to the fourth, I'm going to say the opposite of x to the fourth. Minus 10 times the opposite of x squared plus 9. And the big question of the hour comes right here. Are these two the same? Here's my big question mark. Does the left side equal the right side? And if it does, then you have even an even function. So how do we do this? 
the opposite of x to the fourth power, what's that end up being? How do I figure out what that means? Simplify it. Does anybody know how to write, do this? One over x. That's only when I have a negative exponent can I do that, Colm, but it's a good idea. What's multiplying x right now? What does that dash mean? Negative what? Negative 1, right? So it's negative 1 times 4. So when you have a product raised to a power, the 4 applies itself to the number negative 1 and to the x. So what this really means is negative 1 raised to the fourth power times x to the fourth power. Well, what happens when I say negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 an even number of times? I get 1. So I just come right back to 1x to the fourth or x to the fourth. Anytime you have the opposite of x raised to an even power, it's going to look just like it did when you threw the x in on the right-hand side. So this is x to the fourth. What's the opposite of x squared look like when I simplify it? x squared, right. x squared, so now I have minus 10x squared plus 9. Does the left side equal the right side? Yep, sure does. So that's how you show that something has, that something is an even function and has symmetry about the y-axis. So this is the property you use. So when you don't know, when you don't have the picture to look at, you start with a couple of points. You put in an x value, you evaluate it, then you put in its opposite. And hey, if the y values come out being the same, then you can show this for all x's. You can't just do it with a particular specific x value. You have to prove it for all x's and their opposites. Okay, so this is the property you have to show is true. Right, the next picture we come down to um, is a little, a little different looking. Now we still are putting in x, and we're still putting in the opposite of x, but instead of them being equal, this y value and this y value are opposite. That's what this says. When, when I put in the opposite inputs, my y values are also opposite. And this is when you have an odd function that's symmetric about the origin. So if you look at this particular picture right here, I'm out at 1.28 and my output value is 12.13. If I go in the opposite direction to negative 1.28, guess what? Now, instead of being at exactly the same height, I'm at the opposite value. So these points, if you notice the distance they are from the x-axis, it's exactly the same, excuse me, from the origin, it's exactly the same distance. So now your points would look like this. If you put x in, out comes y or f of x. But now when you put in the opposite of x, what comes out? when you're comparing it to this first point. What comes out when you put the opposite of the opposite of y, right? So the actual um, equation for this um, particular function is also from that um, visualization I showed you. It looks like this. It's what we call a rational function, and we'll be covering those in a couple of weeks. So here's f of x, right? So how would I prove that this is an odd function? I have to show that the function has this property. So where do you begin? We know what f of x looks like. Here it is. What does this look like now when I put that dash in front of it? How do I make a fraction negative? I either put a negative in the top or I put it in the bottom. It doesn't matter where. So this is now what the opposite of f of x looks like. So I already got the right the right hand side of my equation done. It's the opposite of 25x over x squared plus 1. Or you could just put the dash out in front of the whole thing. It doesn't matter. Now you have to figure out what f of the opposite of x is. So to do that, you say, OK, instead of putting an x in, I'm going to put in the opposite of x. 
So everywhere I see X, I'm going to put in the opposite of X. So let's see what I get. Up here, I would get the opposite of X. And down here, remember, always in parentheses. So what does the top give me? Negative 25X over the opposite of X squared is the same as X squared plus 1. Lo and behold, those two sides are now equal. So this is an odd function. So this is how you show even functions and odd functions for all values of x. All right? you, can't, you can start by picking on two points and seeing what their y values look like. Sometimes you'll get a function that is, that is neither even nor odd. For example, let me show you one of those. So if we come back here to our symmetry of functions, um, let's see. This one is odd. This one is even. Well, I thought I had one here that wasn't either. But maybe not. not odd. I guess I don't have one that, um, because I've looked at all of them. So sometimes you'll get a function, for example, I can draw you one. If it doesn't go, if it doesn't fold around your y-axis, so in other words, let's think of x squared, for example. Is x squared an even function? Yeah, because if I go out here to x, I'm up here x, x squared. And if I go come out here the opposite of x, I'm at the opposite of x squared, which is x squared. So, but all I have to do is just shift this parabola so that it's no longer symmetric about the y-axis. And now, let's say this one is uh, f of x equals x um, minus, say, 2 squared. The minute I do that, it's now, it is not symmetric about the y-axis because your line is symmetry instead of being the y-axis is now shifted over here. So you could have a function that isn't symmetric about the origin, nor is it symmetric about the y-axis. And it just doesn't have either type of symmetry. Okay? So that's always a possible answer. So your class activities, now before you get going, let me point out a couple of things about today's class activities. Uh, more than usual, and you have a half an hour to work on these, more than usual, you're being introduced to some new ideas here. So this is like reading a textbook and taking notes, okay? So you're going to be introduced to increasing, decreasing, and constant intervals. That's a new idea for you today. And you're also going to be introduced to the idea of relative minimum and relative maximums, which are called relative extrema. So you may want to make some notes for yourself as you go along. Okay, and I will come along and help you because sometimes this is hard to understand the first time you see it. All right, so you got a good 30 minutes to work on this. Use some colors. If colors will help you, I'll, I'll put some colored pencils on your paper because sometimes it helps you to divide up your domain and range to see how this is working. Okay. Any requests for music? <laughs> 